Heavenly Father, we thank you We thank you that you're a good God and that you are deserving of praise. We thank you that you don't abandon those who belong to you. And we thank you that you love us with an unrelenting love. I pray that now as we transition from worshiping you through the songs that we sing and through the testimonies that we share uh, to worshiping you through the proclamation of your word, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable and pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. I pray, Lord, that your spirit would be actively involved in powering the words that are spoken, but also helping each of us to hear and to understand and to apply the truth of your word to our very lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, whenever we're going to show a a testimony video, I make sure I watch it first so I don't get uh, super affected when I see it in the service. But thank you, Elena, for sharing your story. Um, If you have your Bibles, you can open them to Genesis chapter 11. We're back into our series in Genesis. The series has been called The Origins of God's World. And uh, we only have a couple weeks left. I know that makes many of you very sad, but there's a lot more of the Bible for us to get to. And uh, so we'll, we'll wrap this series up either next week or the week after, depending on um, how I feel. And, uh, and then from there, we'll do a couple of services. And uh, we have some exciting news we'll share with you next week about where we'll be and what we're doing. Um, we know, as I, as I look out, I see people sitting on the floors and, and everywhere, we, we have solutions to these issues, these problems, these good problems, and uh, we'll share a little bit more with you next week when a few things get solidified, but uh, just know that you won't be sitting on the floor forever. Um, but uh, as we've been working our way through this series, we've seen a lot of wonderful things. Today's sermon is called Nimrod, Babel, and Utopianism. A couple of big words in there, we'll explain what we mean by that, but uh, as we come back to our series in Genesis... What we've seen, obviously, we've seen the creation of the world, we've seen the fall, we've seen uh, the establishment of a rival community once Adam and Eve were expelled from the Garden of Eden, led by Cain, we've seen godly lions and ungodly lions, we've seen perversion, we've seen a global cataclysm by the way of the flood. Uh, What we look at today as we get into Genesis chapter 11 is the ongoing sin that still existed in human hearts that rallied together in rebellion against God. When we come to the story of the Tower of Babel, oftentimes we, um, we think about it the way that we heard the story in Sunday school, that a bunch of people got together you know, right, and started building sort of a modern-day skyscraper as high as they could, and God came down and spoiled their building project. Um, Well, that's true so far as it goes, but I think what you need to do first and foremost is banish from your mind the idea that this was just a small band of rebels who decided to build a tower and climb into heaven. Um, There's so much more going on than that. I want you to be reminded that Genesis 1 to 11 contains roughly one third of the earth's history. So we think of about 6,000 years since the creation of the world, we think about 2,000 years since Christ's um, death and burial and resurrection, about 2,000 years between Babel and um, starting in uh, Genesis 12, Abraham to Christ, and about 2,000 years prior to that. And so this is about one-third of earth's history condensed into the first 11 chapters of Genesis, which is part of the reason we get condensed chronology, But when you think about that, if you think about how God has ordained that this is how he's revealing 2,000 years of history, every word, every chapter, every verse is precious. What he chooses to spend time articulating in those first 11 chapters is important. And so what's going on here at the Tower of Babel is important. First of all, I want you to understand that that many pagan myths and sort of extra-biblical creation accounts pick up world history after the flood. They either have a worldwide flood myth, and this is a sort of new creation, 
Or, in many pagan traditions, it's sort of out of the watery abyss that the world is created. And so, many pagan religions actually trace the beginning of their understanding of knowledge to what happens right after the flood. The famous Tower of Babel story and how it was built um, and how it was built is, is about as much more than an ill-fated construction project and language confusion. This, I think, is actually at the, at the heart of the Old Testament worldview, understanding what happened here. We're actually going to take two weeks. We're going to talk about what happened and what was going on. Next week, we'll talk a little bit specifically about the, um, the judgment or the punishment by God. But Babylon was a place where the people sought to make a name for themselves. We'll see that in the text, and so let's read it now. Genesis chapter 11, and I'm going to read the first nine verses. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and butamen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from over the face of all the earth and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord dispersed them over the face of of all the earth. So that's the story, and there's a few things that you might notice as you read it, instead of seeing it sort of on a Sunday school flannel graph, is that this is more than just a tower or a staircase that was supposed to get them to heaven. Notice it goes on, it talks about, let us build a city and a tower. And then when, G- when God comes down, it's he came down to see the city and the tower. What they were building here was a thriving city, metropolis, at the heart of which was a tower that they said would stretch to the heavens. Archaeologists have said this is like a ziggurat, which is sort of a, um, a, a pyramid structure that comes in and goes up and comes in and goes up. And traditionally in the ancient world, these were always a place where the people were said to commune with the gods. Interestingly, when you jump ahead in world history to Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar, there was a, a place in the city of, in the middle of Babylon where there was rubble. So Babylon's this big, elegant um, city full of uh, wondrous things, and yet in the middle of the city they left this rubble, and the rubble was, me- it was said to be the Tower of Babel that had been destroyed over time, and they left that there as a reminder, and Nebuchadnezzar There's writings where Nebuchadnezzar says that one day, when their fame and their greatness is enough, they'll be able to rebuild that tower and do it right this time. And so you have this this city and this tower that were built. It's interesting when you look at a lot of archaeologists, what they they seem to suggest is that this tower was actually at the center of the the city, and the, and the, the city was, or the tower was almost like a modern day apartment building with the bottom, the base of it, a big giant slab where inside many people lived. And then on top of that, it was built. So it's sort of at the hub of this, of this city center. And there's several things that I, I want you to notice. First of all, I want you to jump back to chapter 10 because there's a few things to notice. Remember that chapter 10 is the genealogy of Noah's three sons. And what you have starting in verse 21 is the genealogy of Shem. And when we taught through that genealogy, we said that it's out of Shem, it's the line of Shem, that the Messiah comes. It's the promised line of the seed of the woman. 
What's interesting, if you jump ahead where it says um, in verse 4 of chapter 11 in our text today, it says, Then they said, Come and let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves. That word that's translated name is actually the Hebrew word Shem, which is interesting. What is it that they're trying to do? It's not just build a name for themselves. It's not like you know trying to build up their Twitter following here. But what they're doing, they're building a Shem for themselves. Shem is the promised line through which the Messiah would come. This is the line that God chose to bring about His deliverer. And so there's a play on words here where the author is saying they were trying to make a Shem for themselves. They're trying to make their own messianic line. They're trying to be their own deliverers. That's the whole point of this Tower of Babel. The other thing I want you to notice is that when it's going through the sons of Ham, and you remember Ham was the line that was cursed, and so you get the, two, you get the split there, Ham's sons and um, and uh, Canaan's sons. Canaan's sons are all cursed. They don't last very long in world history, but Ham's sons actually go on to build the great empires of the ancient world. You see there, verse 8, it says, Cush fathered Nimrod, and he was the first on earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. We said that that's not hunting big game. That's actually a hunter of men. You don't get to be an empire builder without violence towards your fellow man. So Nimrod was this great mighty man, and notice that it says that, verse 10, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalna in the land of Shinar. So Nimrod is actually the architect. Nimrod is sort of the centerpiece of this rebellion that built this city and this tower that was called Babylon. Again, I say that that, uh, you could call this the Tower of Babylon. It's the same Hebrew word. It's just translated here, Babel, um, because it's uh, similar to the Hebrew word for confusion, so it's another play on words here. But you could call this the Tower of Babylon. I want to talk a little bit about Nimrod, and this is actually the first point of the sermon today. Nimrod, the ancient rebel, is the prototype for paganism and human deification. I get there's a lot of big words in there. Let's talk about them. But Nimrod is an ancient rebel. His name actually means rebel or let us rebel. That's what his name actually means. And he's this prototype for paganism and human deification. So it's interesting. What you see is post-flood world, a lot of the ancient world is beginning to develop its religion and its religious practices. And you have a lot of archaeologists. I'm, I'm, I'm actually relying um, pretty heavily on a guy named Alexander Hislop, if you want to write that down, and a guy named David Rawl, R-O-H-L. And these are two... Uh, David Rawl is actually one of the leading British Egyptologists. And Alexander His, Hislop is originally an, uh, a linguist, a historical linguist. Doesn't that sound like an exciting job, kids? So he traces language and develops history through it. Super exciting career. If you want a career in that, come and talk to me. So Alexander Hislop and David Rawl, what what they trace back is really interesting. They say that post-flood, what you see is a lot of um, religions started by sort of worshiping a goddess mother a sort of Mother Earth figure. Isn't it interesting that even nowadays you have a lot of pagans, a lot of non-Christians, people who claim themselves to be atheists, who, who talk about, you know, Mother Nature, right? All of this started, this is David Rawls' um, uh, dissertation, actually. He says all of this started with a sort of deified Eve, that there's this fertility goddess that many of these um, many of these ancient religions so in the babylonians called her ishtar the canaanites called her astarta it, in the old testament she's called ashtaroth she's isis of the greeks but all of this is pointing to a sort of deified eve as the mother of all and in a lot of the religious artwork what you see is this this goddess mother who's holding a child in her arms. That child is David Rawl and uh, Alexander Hislop have both postulated this, not working together, actually working independently. uh, Alexander Hislop has a book called The Two Babylons where he says that that 
son in the arms of that goddess mother is none other than Nimrod himself. What he's done, very interestingly, is you can actually trace the languages back, right? Because all of the languages were confused at Babel, and so each group of people that were given a different language were dispersed in different areas, and yet they all had legends about this great city builder that can be traced back to Nimrod. So David Rawl has identified Marduk of the Babylonians, Osiris of the Egyptians, Baal of the Canaanites, Bacchus of the Romans, Gilgamesh of Uruk to the ancient Sumerians, Krishna and his avatar Vishnu, Hercules and Thor, and Orion. All traced back linguistically to Nimrod. And what's interesting about this is in all of these pictures, what you have is this picture of this goddess mother with a child in his arms. And when you think about it, I want you to think about some of the paintings that you've seen. If you're a history buff, you'll, you'll get this. If not, then just flow with me. If you go and you start Googling Thor, you're going to get a whole bunch of Marvel movies. But once you get past that to some of the actual history, what you see is that very early depictions of Thor had him with an axe, not a hammer, sorry. And some of the very early depictions, earliest depictions we have of Thor is of a guy with a giant axe actually putting the axe through the head of a snake. Also, some of the earliest depictions in art that we have of Hercules is of Hercules. You actually saw this in the Disney movie, um, but uh, if you watched the Disney movie um, from many, many years ago. Um, but you have Hercules in sort of a, a, a crib or something that a baby would be in as an infant holding on to serpents. It's depicted in the art of uh, uh, the day. You also have Gilgamesh in his great epic. He actually battles and destroys a sea serpent. He actually defeats the sea serpent, Tiamat, by cutting off its head. What's um, early depictions of Orion, right? We have the, uh, the constellation Orion. Early depictions of Orion actually have Orion with a bow and arrow firing an arrow into the head of a snake. So what, what, what I hope you see with all of this is that in the ancient religions, they have a sort of deified Eve figure, a goddess mother, who's holding a child in their hands, and that child takes on different forms, whether it's Hercules or Thor or Gilgamesh or whomever, but all of these children are depicted as tackling, wrestling, crushing the head of a snake. Why? Because what was going on at Babylon was much more than just a building project of people trying to walk their way into heaven. It was Nimrod at the center of it talking about their ability to be their own deliverers. They don't need the seed of the woman who will crush the head of the snake because they have their own semi-divine human God, right, demi-God, who would deliver them. And so the whole idea of Babel was the idea that they would come together, defying God's command to go out and multiply, that they would come together and they could save themselves. They could make a Shem, they could make a messianic line for themselves. Here's a quote by uh, the British Egyptologist David Rawl. He says, thus, from Assyria, Egypt, and Greece, we have cumulative and overwhelming evidence all conspiring to demonstrate that the child worshipped in the arms of the goddess mother in all of these countries of Ninus or Nin, the son was Nimrod, the son of Cush. A feature here or an incident there may have been borrowed from some succeeding hero, but it seems impossible to doubt that of the, that child, Nimrod, was the prototype, the grand original. The amazing extent of the worship of this man indicates something very extraordinary in his stature or character. Though by setting up as king, Nimrod invaded the patriarchal system and abridged, and abridged the liberties of mankind, yet he was held by many to have conferred benefits upon them that amply indemnified them for the loss of their liberties and covered him with glory and renown." For this very thing, he seems to have gained the title emancipator or deliverer. All tradition from the earliest times bears testimony to the apostasy of Nimrod and to his success in leading men away from the patriarchal faith 
and delivering their minds from that awe of God and fear of the judgment of heaven that must have rested on them while yet in the memory of the flood was recent. And according to all the principles of depraved human nature, this too, no doubt, was one grand element in his fame. So what David Rawl is saying is that Nimrod, at the center of this rebellion, was teaching the people that they didn't need the faith of their forefathers. They didn't need the faith of Noah and of his, um, and of Japheth and of Shem. They didn't need that faith because they could be their own deliverers. They didn't need the protection of God because even if there was a global flood, they could build a tower in a city with big enough walls to keep the floodwaters out and a high enough tower to save them from the flood. This is the whole thing. So what Nimrod was doing was he was actually setting up the sort of pagan religions that we still see in the world today. You don't need Christianity because you have a government that will help you, right? Who was it who said uh, that some of the most terrifying words in the English language are, we're from the government, we're here to help? <laughs> but but what, you have, what you have here with Nimrod was the establishment of a humanistic religion. You don't need someone up there because we can reach there ourselves, You don't need a deliverer who's going to come through the seat of the woman because we can actually be our own deliverers. He was the first one to say, let's let's break apart these bonds, these shackles, these chains, and let's be our own masters. That's what the message of Nimrod was. Let us cast aside our chains. Let's free ourselves from the oppression of a judgmental God. So he builds an empire which robs men of their freedom but gives them perceived power. Sound familiar? What this is, is it's the beginning of the establishment in the war between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of man. Right? What you have is is a sort of solidified, we don't need God because we can do it ourselves. And Nimrod was the prototype, right? He became worshipped, and led people away from the patriarchal faith. Okay, here's the second point. Notice that instead of obeying God's command to multiply and spread out, the people rebelled by congregating and building up. The rebellion of of Babel goes directly against God's command. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, right? Spread out, fill it. They did the exact opposite. They congregated together, clumped together, and built up. Instead of spreading out, they built up. And so this is direct defiance against the uh, commands of God. Um, According to the uh, the historian Josephus, Josephus, this is a quote from um, the Antiquities of the Jews, Book 1, Chapter 4. Josephus says this, says, Nimrod said that he would be revenge, that he would revenge upon God if he should have a mind to drown the world again, for that he would build a tower too high for the waters to reach, and that he would avenge himself on God for destroying their forefathers. Isn't that an interesting quote? That what Josephus said, now he lived years and years later, I don't know what his sources were, but what Josephus said was that this was the motivation of Nimrod. I'm going to build something so high the floodwaters couldn't get there even if God wanted to drown me in the first place. And in doing so, I'm actually going to exact my revenge on God for the murder of my forefathers. What you see here is this hostility towards God that I think is still going on in the world around us. See, it used to be it used to be that somebody could choose to follow God or somebody could choose a different religion. But nowadays what you have is you have such a hatred towards God that there's not even an acceptance of those who want to truly follow Him. And that's what we saw, see with Nimrod, this, this vengefulness, this spite, this, this hatred. At the end of the day, what it's showing is the rebellion in the human heart that hates anything and anyone that they're supposed to bow to. We don't want to submit. We want to be our own gods. So instead of obeying God's command to multiply and spread out, the people rebelled, congregated, and built up. This utter defiance is not unlike the utter defiance that we see in our own world, right? Whether by political authorities defying God's commands, church leaders binding the consciences of God's servants, 
rebelling against God's design for gender, sexuality, family. We live in a culture that does outright defy what God has very clearly stated in His Word. Here's the third point. Babel typifies mankind's rebellious desire to be their own God and to return to paradise. I, I want you to notice that it's not just the tower, that every time it says it in the text here, it's the tower and the city. The point here was that they wanted to come together and build their own paradise. We don't need to get back to Eden. Remember I said in the first couple chapters after the expulsion of Eden that there would have been a, a lingering in the minds of man of wanting to get back to Eden, wanting to get back to paradise. Because of how long the lifespans were, you still had Adam and you still had Abel around, or not, not Abel, sorry, not Abel, so long, but you still had the patriarchs around long enough to be reminded of what Eden was like. But here what you have is a decided or a, a, a decision to no longer long to be back at Eden, but to now create our own paradise. We're going to create our own city. Here we're going we're to do everything right. At the end of the day, this story is about man deciding that they don't need to return to God or Eden because they can do it themselves. This is the same lie that was told to Eve, right? You can live apart from God. You can define right and wrong for yourself. You can be like God. I think what's at the center of the story is that mankind is typically not happy with the way in which God has already made us like Him. We're made in His image, but that's not enough for us. We actually want His job. And because we want His job, we'll do everything we can to usurp Him. Here's, I think, the big idea of, of this kind of part one of, of the Tower of Babel. Here's the big idea. All human efforts of progress apart from God are a perversion. I want to say that again. All human efforts of progress apart from God are a perversion. A lot's to be said about being progressive these days, isn't it? We want to progress. We want to go forward. We want, we want to get better. We want, we want better communities and better people and better health care and better education and all that kind of stuff. Yes, absolutely and amen. We want, better, we want to get better at everything. We want, we want to be sanctified not only individually but as a people, as nations, as communities. Absolutely. But every human effort of progress apart from God is simply a perversion. I want you to think through this story. The Tower of Babel shows a human kingdom built by men, but Daniel 2 promises a kingdom not built by human hands that breaks the empires of mankind and sets up a kingdom of God on earth. The tower was supposed to, quote, reach to the heavens, signifying man storming heaven's gates. But earth doesn't invade heaven. Heaven invades earth, right? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So it's a perversion. It's showing us that Earth can invade heaven. That's what this is at the heart of this story. That's not the biblical narrative. The biblical narrative is that heaven comes to earth. The tower shows man going to God, but the biblical story is one of God coming to man. Paganism shows men becoming gods, but the history of redemption is about one true God becoming a man that he might pay for the sins of humanity and bring us in himself back into the presence of the Father. So everything about this story perverts the actual gospel, perverts the actual biblical story of redemption. This is about man building paradise on earth, but we will not return to Eden until this world is eradicated of its sin by the judgment of God and the fulfillment of the Great Commission. And I want to say that this is incredibly relevant. This isn't just a story about ancient history and this one city and this one guy who wanted to be like God and usher in paradise on earth. Because every tyrannical dictator in the history of humankind has wanted to do this too. This is what the World Economic Forum is all about right now. This is Klaus Schwab's Great Reset, right? Like This, this, is, this is still in the minds of greedy, ungodly politicians who think that they can usher in paradise on earth if they just get the right policies in place. If they just break us apart from the chains of our bondage to that Judeo-Christian uh, bygone era. 
Every, every historical, this is, this is what every dictator down through history was after. We can make Eden on earth. We can perfect humanity, right? Eugenics, all of this stuff. It's all coming back to Babel. It's all coming back to the rebellion of Nimrod when man said, we can be our own deliverer. We don't need the seed of the woman. All of it comes back to that. And so all efforts of progress that any man, any woman makes apart from the Word of God and the authority of God is simply a perversion. So here's a couple of practical implications to pull out of that big idea. Number one, only the application of God's Word can solve the problems in our world. The personal, social, societal, political, and even religious evils of the world can only be defeated by the power of the Spirit and the application of God's Word personally and socially. It's not if we, it's not if we elect the right person then Canada will be a Christian nation again. It's, it's not if only we put the right policy in place, if only we can get some laws to protect the unborn, if only we can get some laws prohibiting um, marriage that would offend God. That's not what we're after. That's an end game, that's a tool, that's part of the battle, that's us running all kinds of plays, but at the end of the day, the only thing that solves the problems of the world is the application of God's Word personally, and then socially. And that leads to the second point, which is this. The discipleship of the nations works from the inside out. We, we, oftentimes, what, what, um, what Christians get accused of when we start talking about bringing the Word of God to bear on the culture around us is a sort of top-down approach. If only we can get the right legislation passed, if only we can get the right people elected, right? Then from the top-down we can implement God's law and society will be back to normal. That's not the way the gospel works. The gospel works from the inside out. There's a, there's a great principle. I'm reading this wonderful book. It's called In the House of Tom Bombadil. All the Lord of the Rings fans kind of snickered a little bit. but So Tom Bombadil is a character in Lord of the Rings. Please forgive me if you don't like Lord of the Rings. I would, I would ask what's wrong with you, but... I, <laughs> um, He's a character in Lord of the Rings, and this whole book, the big idea of this book is the idea that Tom Bombadil, who's probably the most powerful creature in Middle-earth, when, when the, the hobbits first encounter Tom Bombadil, if you've only seen the movies, he's not in there, sorry. You've got to read the books to get Tom Bombadil. The hobbits go through, and they find Tom Bombadil. The, the ring of power doesn't even have power over old Tom. He puts it on, he doesn't disappear. He kind of flips it around in the air. He flippantly gives it back to Frodo. It has no power over him in terms of its, its compelling power, nor does it have any power to actually make him disappear. The whole point of the book, uh, of this book that I'm reading in the House of Tom Bombadil, written by C.R. Wiley, little plug, is that Tom Bombadil understands what it means to take dominion. The point there is that if everybody in Middle Earth was doing what Tom did, then they wouldn't have needed a fellowship to go and dis, uh, uh, get rid of the ring in, in Mordor in the first place because Tom rules over his land with justice, with fairness. Tom Bombadil rules his land, has taken dominion, and nothing can get in there. The, the point that I'm trying to make is that we often think, if only we can do this, if only we can do that, and we're always thinking of these top-down approaches. Do you know how the, the world changes? The world changes by your home being transformed. And, and the home of the family that's right behind you being transformed and in front of you being transformed. And a community of people with transformed homes worshiping together in a transformed community. And then you're not the same person when you go to work. You're not the same person when you rub shoulders with your neighbors. You are looking at what God has placed right in front of you and you're taking dominion over what God, the spheres in which God has placed you. The transformation of the world happens one individual at a time. Individuals make up households. Households make up churches. Churches make up communities. Communities make up counties. Counties make up provinces. Provinces make up nations. This is how, this is God's blueprint for evangelism and the discipleship of the nations. 
But then what happens is we can't get caught up in the Tower of Babel mentality of getting sucked in and insular. That's the death. What we are called to do is go and multiply. That means that whatever happens here, whatever way in which the Word of God takes root in your heart, however it is that you are transformed here, you take that transformation, you take the truth that you're seeing in God's Word, and you take it where you live. You take it where you work. You take it to your kids. You take it to your family. You take it to your friends. That's what taking dominion looks like. And so, in a world that wants a top-down approach to progress, We'll legislate so that everybody uses the right pronouns and everybody thinks the right things and we'll censor anything that goes against the utopian plans that we have for this nation. That's a top-down approach. How you combat a top-down approach is by taking dominion where God has placed you. Become as independent as you can and become as integrated as you can at the same time. And as you do that, and you let the Word of God take root in your family, in your household, then it slowly takes a grip on the nation that's around us. We don't want progress the way the world wants progress. We want the Word of God to take root in our nation in such a way that those roots cannot be dug out again. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Word, which teaches us what it looks like to be your faithful people. I pray, Lord, that you would help us, help us to be faithful, help us to look at the spheres in which you've placed us, and I pray, Lord, that you would show us what godly dominion looks like. Help our personal lives to reflect your purity. Help our marriages to reflect your gospel. Help our households to reflect your grace, and help our church community to reflect your mission. And as that happens, Lord, I pray that we would slowly start to see that the darkness around us does lift. It doesn't lift all at once, and it doesn't lift from the top down, but it lifts as regular, everyday Christians continue to be regular, everyday Christians. Help us to do so faithfully, and help us to do so to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.